Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. You guys have requested them a lot lately, and this overview is going to be all about the Koreans. They specialize in towers and onagers, which aren't things you're probably used to basing your strategy around. Well, unless you're like me and love mass onagers. In this video, we'll break down their bonuses, unique units, and tech tree, and see if we can make sense of what are some really interesting bonuses and units on paper. Let's check it out. The Korean team bonus is that their mangonels and onagers have plus one range, though in the expansions it's changed to reduced minimum range, which is less useful in my opinion, but we'll save talk about the expansions for a little bit later. The plus one range means mangonels have eight range in castle age, which is one more than a crossbowman, which they do typically counter, and that makes the Korean mangonel extra effective in that situation. When this really gets crazy though is in post-imperial age, and their siege onagers have 11 range, which to put in context is one less than an elite longbowman. Even a bombard cannon with siege engineers only outranges Korean siege onagers by 2 instead of the usual 4 or 5. Now bombard cannons are normally a really strong counter to onagers, but against Koreans it almost feels like the counters are reversed if they're not paying attention. Korean siege onagers even outrange Persian, Celt, Frank, Malian, and Slav castles by one because they all lack bracer. Speaking of Celts, the best part of this being a team bonus is that when you're allied with other siege civilizations, it makes all of your allies perform just that much better. With a Celt ally for instance, they not only have their usual bonuses and techs like faster firing and more HP on their onagers, but they also get that plus one range. Moving on to their civilization specific bonuses, the first is that their villagers have plus 3 line of sight. We can see it goes from a radius of 4 tiles of sight up to 7. Just to visualize that in a real game context, you can see the Korean villagers gain a lot more sight right at the start, and they become just as good if not better at scouting your starting area than the normal scout that you start with. Apparently Koreans make the villagers with the worst eyesight perform scouting duties for some reason. The only negative thing to point out about it is unless you're looking for missing sheep, you probably won't be scouting much with villagers who walk slowly and have way more value to you as resource collectors. I suppose it's true that they see wolves coming from a bit earlier and so you're more likely to be able to angle yourself to get an elevation combat bonus or it might be helpful every once in a while to see enemy units or towers coming a bit earlier than other civilizations would. In terms of early warning for lumberjacks for example, it gives you about the line of sight as having town watch, so I like to think of it as comparable to that. The second civilization bonus is that their stone miners collect 20% faster. For people who like specific numbers, that improves the collection rate by about 4 more stone per minute per villager. This is the first hint of why the Koreans are thought of as a tower civilization, and it makes tower rushing obviously more effective. To get a sense of how much it helps, you need 7 Korean stone miners to keep 3 tower builders working constantly, whereas other civilizations need 8. I don't really consider this much of an economy bonus though, since its usefulness in Feudal Age depends on going for the very specific strategy of either tower rushing or saving up for some kind of castle draw, so it's pretty limited in its flexibility. I thought you might be able to take advantage of it by collecting stone and selling it as opposed to mining gold directly in the Feudal Age, but the positive effect from that with Koreans is negligible, and it gets you an extra 3 gold for the first 100 stones sold, and for the next 100 sold it's less than 1 extra gold profit, and after that you're better off mining gold directly, so it doesn't seem like it's worth the trouble. Continuing the tower rush theme though, the third civilization bonus is that their tower upgrades are free, although the bombard cannon requires chemistry first. That's a pretty decent amount of resources, though most of that is coming in the imperial age where you'll have a stronger economy anyway. There's also the research time save to consider and that comes in at just under 3 minutes, which isn't a lot but it is better than nothing. So there you go, the tower upgrades are coming in a little ahead of the curve, and the fact that we had the earlier stone bonus means you even have an extra tower or two up. No wonder everybody says Koreans are a tower rushing civilization. It's about to get even better though. 
The fourth Civ bonus is that their tower range, not including Bombard Towers, increases by one in Castle and another one in Imperial. That's on top of towers having 8 base range and 3 more from blacksmith upgrades, for a total of 13 range in post imperial. That's pretty significant, because one of the tower's arch nemeses is the bombard cannon, and the Koreans 13 range means they're the only towers that can fire back against all non-Turk bombard cannons. Extra range just makes your towers better at everything they do, whether it's an offensive push to get villagers off of a woodline, or defensive around your own town to protect your economy. This is even more true when we talk about the expansions after the addition of the new arrow slits technology. So that's the Koreans bonuses, lots of tower and a bit of onager stuff in there. Now let's move on to their first unique unit, the War Wagon. The game says it's a horse-drawn archery unit, so it seems intuitive that it's a variation of the cavalry archer. Though as a quick note in the expansions, they said one of the things they changed was making the war wagons correctly classified as cavalry archers. So I'm no Sherlock Holmes master of deduction, but I believe that means they weren't properly classified before. Let's take a look at that. Cavalry archers take bonus damage from camels, pikemen, halberdier, and skirmishers. Most of those are identical for the war wagons, except it looks like they take slightly less bonus damage from skirmishers. In the expansions, the change seems to be that the war wagons take the regular 6 damage from elite skirmishers, making them a little bit better counter now. So that's the hidden bonus damage, now let's take a look at their stats compared to the regular cavalry archers. We can see the war wagon is basically a much tankier version of the cavalry archer line, with about triple the HP of its cavalry archer counterparts, as well as higher attack, more pierce armor combined with the slightly less bonus damage from skirmishers, and the elite version even has an extra range, while costing actually a bit less gold per unit. They're even created faster than cavalry archers and see a bit further, so what's the downside? Well, there's a few things. They cost three times as much wood, they require a castle to create, cavalry archers move noticeably faster, and also seem to fire about 25% faster. That still makes their damage output less than the war wagon, but not as far behind as it initially appears. A side note I want to put in here is the war wagons aren't particularly affected by thumb ring, and their accuracy isn't increased at all by it. In a previous video on the Thumbring tech, I found War Wagons were the third least affected archer unit in the whole game. Cavalry archers, on the other hand, benefited by far the most, and basically demand that you prioritize Thumbring if you plan to use them, which at 550 total resources is not that far off the investment of a castle. Let that sink in. Overall, if you're going for War Wagons, there's that nice intrinsic savings that you don't need to prioritize Thumbring, or even make archery ranges at all if you don't want to. Looking now at the Elite upgrade, it's fairly expensive at 1000 wood and 800 gold, and it basically gives you 50 extra HP and 1 extra range. Personally, I'm more interested in the extra range than the extra HP, since you'll probably want something in front of your wagons to keep the enemy pikes engaged, and the extra range is going to let them attack from a bit safer distance, as well as allow them to reach Elite Skirmishers, which up to that point outrange them by 1. In general, the big selling feature of War Wagons for me is the relatively low rate of turnover. So while they're expensive to get up and running, leaving you a bit vulnerable while you mass them up, if you choose to go for them and survive to that point, you end up being very efficient with your population space. Their pierce armor also makes them very effective against archers and cavalry archers as an outright counter. As a side note for anyone wondering, while they do have a very similar projectile animation to scorpions, they don't have the same ability to fire through units, which we can see here. Now on the other side, if you run into war wagons yourself, remember that they do take bonus damage from pikes and skirmishers, while costing a lot to build, so those are good counter units. Units with high pierce armor like Huskarls and Eagle Warriors are also going to be strong, as well as statistically powerful units like Paladins and War Elephants. Typically you'll see War Wagons combined with Korean Siege Onagers and Halberdiers to cover some of those weaknesses, and it can be a surprisingly difficult combination to counter, which is why you're going to want to make sure to attack the Koreans and cripple their economy as early as possible. That's just the first unique unit though, Koreans are lucky enough to have two, so let's check out the second. On the water they have the very unique turtle ship. They sort of look like a short range cannon galleon, but even more expensive. Compared directly to an elite cannon galleon, the big thing that jumps out is that it has less than half the range of its cannon galleon counterpart. The improvement is almost double the HP, greater attack, and better melee armor. The thing is, the range is the cannon galleon's selling feature, so maybe they're not really like the cannon galleon at all. 
If we instead look at them as a galleon replacement, they cost roughly three times the resources and do seem to hold their own when they're outnumbered by about three to one in open water. We could say then that they are about equal when it comes to resources spent, of course leaning more heavily on gold than wood, and we can definitely say they're better in terms of getting the most out of your population space. So while your navy of 20 turtle ships costs the same number of resources as 62 galleons, and they can hold up to them okay on the water, that situation gives you an extra 42 population space to play with, which means a bigger economy or more land units. And plus, they're built faster than three galleons, so you can build up your fleet and replace it faster. It's a similar situation to the war wagon though, in that you need to have a critical mass of them. And the difficulty is in getting your economy to the point that you can get up that initial group. As for how they perform against other types of ships, if we look at it from the perspective that one turtle ship is the equivalent of three galleons, we can look at how they do against the common naval unit types. In this particular setup, we see the turtle ship and three galleons perform similarly against an enemy galleon, which lines up with the previous test. On the other hand, we can see a turtle ship seems to do much better in terms of its proportional health remaining against both heavy demolition ships and fast fire ships. Meaning that in close engagements like this, if we look at the percentage of health at the end compared to the start, the turtle ship is doing a better job of holding up than three galleons. The other thing to remember, and we're going off into mathematical territory here, is you're worse off losing two out of three units than you are losing two thirds of the health on a much stronger unit. Against the fast fire ship in particular, we can really see this effect happening. And the one galleon remaining from that fight does one third the damage that the original three did combined. So you've lost two thirds of your offensive power there. While the turtle ship down to two thirds health still attacks for its full damage. And that's the hidden advantage of turtle ships. After a winning engagement, they can retain more of their damage output potential than a larger navy of galleons that loses several ships. Once you have a decent navy with turtle ships in the front, as long as you're taking smart fights and the damage you're taking is reasonably distributed, you retain that offensive strength of your navy much longer than a galleon army with a similar investment, which is prone to having ships picked off. A last thing to note is that their upgrade to Elite is quite expensive at 1000 food and 800 gold, but for that you're getting 50% more HP as well as a bit of extra armor. Considering the high cost of each turtle ship, that pays off pretty quickly, and after 8 or 9 ships, it's already paid for itself. Moving on from the unique units, let's take a look at their unique tech, which is plus one range for mangonels and onagers. If that sounds familiar, it's because, yes, that was also their team bonus. But the idea is that both of those stack. It's a bit pricey at 800 wood and 500 gold, and it's one of those first time it's free, second time you gotta pay double sorts of things. But it's definitely worth the investment if you see yourself going for onagers, which you should, because they're the best unit in the game. Cue the ontage. Now in the Kelt overview, I made a point of showing how useful their 50% greater HP is, and that allows them to survive a direct Onager shot. But it's interesting to note that in mass AI Onager battles, the Koreans can actually come out on top because of their greater range. Whether or not that's better than the Kelt's faster firing and more HP is kind of subjective though, and some people might even like the faster moving Mongol Siege Onagers the best. Taking a look now at the HD expansion's Castle Age unique tech, it's that turtle ships move 15% faster. If we test them out before this tech, they're noticeably slower than cannon galleons and galleons. After this tech, it brings them up to still slower than a cannon galleon. Honestly, it doesn't feel like this tech does a whole lot, but it also has a fairly low cost, so you might decide to grab it for a bit of unexpected speed. It's true that one of the biggest problems I've found with using the turtle ships is how hard it is to force your opponent to engage them, and I can see that this is meant as an attempt to address that. Other expansion changes worth mentioning is first of all, like I said, the team bonus is that their minimum range is reduced, so they can fire at things from a bit closer, but lose one off their maximum range. Also, there's a new bonus of plus 25% fortification build speed, Basically, Koreans build castles, walls, towers, and gates in 25% less time than other civilizations. But as I talked about in a separate video, if you're planning to make fortified walls in the expansions, you should make them stone walls first, and then upgrade them after that, because something funky is happening with the fortified walls build time. 
The turtle ships have been changed a little bit as well and they no longer need a castle and they're a tiny bit cheaper. I think they're just trying to make the unit a bit more friendly to include in your navy and to me that's a good thing because up till now I've rarely seen them used. The boar wagons now take that bonus damage from anti-cavalry archer units which was the change from 4 to 6 bonus damage from skirmishers that I talked about before and they also cost a bit less now at 110 wood. Finally, it's worth mentioning that towers are better in general within the expansions because of the arrow slits technology, so that could be seen as an indirect Korean buff, since they're one of the few civilizations that would strongly consider using towers anyway. So that's the bonuses, unique units, and expansion changes. Now let's move on to the tech tree, starting with the archers. In general, they have some good options in techs, and I'd say the war wagon counts as a beefy cavalry archer, so we can subtly include it in here as well. No early bonuses means that the archer rush is mediocre or below average in feudal age, but after that I think the archers start to get a bit better. I'd give them a B plus overall. Up next we have infantry. The Koreans are missing blast furnace and have no infantry bonuses, but I like the halberdier and the option for champions. I'd say it's a B minus, since I'd consider a perfect tech tree without bonuses to only be in the B or B plus range. Up next we have the cavalry. Now the Hazar seems really nice until you notice the missing Imperial Age blacksmith techs and bloodlines. The lack of bloodlines also means that the Night Rush and to a lesser extent the Scout Rush are going to suffer as well. Because of all those things, the rating potential late in the game I would say is far below average and I'm going to say it's a C, which could very easily have been lower if not for the Hazar. Next up we'll take a look at the Siege. The plus 3 range on the Onagers is pretty fantastic. What's scary is that the Koreans also get Bombard Cannons, and I think that really separates them from the Celts. Considering the team bonus, open tech tree, and unique tech, I'm going to give them an A for Siege. When I made the Celt overview, I gave them an A thinking maybe I'd give the Koreans an A+, but I think the A plus grade is going to have to go to the Celts with Koreans as allies. Now let's take a look at the Navy. The Galley Rush definitely isn't a specialty of the Koreans, with no early economy or ship bonuses. There's also no demolition ship at all, which is a bit unusual, but it's not really that big of a deal. I like the shipwright, as well as heated shot and bracer, and I was pleasantly surprised with how the turtle ships held up in the late game water battles. Overall, I can't really justify anything higher than a C for the early water game and a B plus for the late game, giving a B minus overall. The thing about the turtle ships is they're so slow you don't really get to decide when to take the water battles, which means it's hard to really take full advantage of them. I'm just not convinced that Koreans can compete with other top tier water civilizations in the late game. Looking quickly at the monks, they're not particularly great, especially since they're missing redemption. It's a bit sad that Koreans also don't get heresy considering how tanky and expensive their units are. There are a couple of nice techs here, so overall I'd give them a C plus for monks. Moving on to defenses, now this is a nice looking university tech tree. Especially considering that they gather stone faster, their towers get plus 2 range by Imperial Age, they get free tower upgrades, and the Koreans are full of counter units, like hand cannoneers, halberdiers, turtle ships, war wagons, bombard cannons, and long range siege onagers. I give the Koreans an A for defenses, and an A plus in the expansions because of their faster construction speed for fortifications. They not only have the turtle ship on water down, but the turtle strategy on land as well. And if you like to wall up and build towers with Byzantines, you'll probably like it even more as Koreans. Take a look now at the economy. Like I've already said, there's no strong early economy bonus, but most of the economy techs are here. I'd give it a B-, which might sound high based on what I've said, but one thing that helps them out that's easy to overlook is that they're very efficient with population space, relying on expensive units like war wagons and turtle ships rather than numbers, and that frees up more population space to economy than I think other civilizations can get away with. So as a bit of a wrap up, I think of Koreans as one of the masters of Black Forest and other wallable maps, and the Onagers and War Wagons are a big part of that. It takes them a while to get going, but once you have your army built up, it's incredibly difficult to counter. On the other hand, their weakness is ultimately that they're a booming sort of civilization as well, and the fact that it takes them a while to get rolling. So you're going to have more trouble generating early pressure, which means other booming sorts of civilizations have a chance to do that against you as well. Another tough situation is if you don't have allies to trade with, since onagers, war wagons, and turtle ships are all very gold intensive. Those are my thoughts on the Koreans though. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.